Thank you so much, uh, Antonella. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about the role of the gut microbiota and early life immune development and perhaps prevention of allergy. So these are my disclosures to begin with. So we're interested in the microbiome for many reasons. I, I think most people here, I don't have to convince you anymore, but there's a lot of bacteria living in us and on us. At least half the cells in the human body are not human at all. Um, if you count up all the genes associated with these microbes, there's two to three million genes, which of course dwarfs the human genome, which is only 25,000 genes. All of this genetic capability provides for a lot of enzymatic machinery, which releases our, is, the, is responsible for the release of literally thousands of metabolites. And many of these metabolites can have effects on the host. And that's really, I think, one of the key areas for research at the moment is First of all, trying to discover many of these uh, metabolites, associate them with disease, and look at their immunoregulatory uh, activities. But from an immunology point of view, I think we can all appreciate that we have grossly underestimated the intimacy of the interactions between the host immune system and the microbiome. You know, you have this huge amount of foreign antigen, you have these large quantities of danger signals, and you don't have tissue damaging inflammatory responses at mucosal sites, at least in health. So you know, there's very, very potent regulatory mechanisms in place that control the immune response's reaction to the presence of these microbes. And our hypothesis and where we're working from is that certain microbes actually very strongly promote these regulatory responses. So then if you lose these microbes, you lose these factors that normally would promote immune regulation. But there's many host benefits that have been described associated with the microbiome. So protection against infection has been reliably shown for a long time. So the microbes take up the real estate. They're non-infectious themselves, the vast majority of the commensal microbiome. But they prevent, when you occasionally encounter a pathogen, they prevent that pathogen adhering and invading. Uh, They compete for nutrients and so on and so forth. The immune maturation of the immune system is clearly seen, so the signals from the microbiome will drive a lot of immune responses that, including regulatory responses, will also drive the effector responses, and that's clear. I think more recently, um, the influence of the microbiome on host metabolism is more clearly being defined and recognized. And probably the most recent, I think, appreciation is the influence of the microbiome on mood and behavior. So 90% of the serotonin in your body is made by microbes in the gut, just as one example. And I think over and over, people are now showing that there's disturbances in the, at least the microbial composition at different body sites in practically every disease known to man. Of course, this does not mean causality. This is an association. But I think further studies really and the basic mechanistic and functional studies are coming um, to, uh, to look in more detail at the association with these microbial changes and, and all these different things. So from an immune point of view, um, again, I think this is a really hot topic. People are really investigating uh, what are the mechanisms by which the immune system sees and responds to these different bacteria. And really all the cells uh, in, at mucosal sites can respond to bacteria from the epithelial cells to the innate cells, so whichever is your favorite cell type, bacteria or their metabolites can have an effect. And I think in the allergy world, of course, we're probably most interested in the induction of tolerance. And many mechanisms are now being described where there's either a direct effect of the microbes on cells driving tolerance or an indirect effect. Um, and I'll touch on some of these during my talk today. So as we've already heard, we were not born with a a microbiome. Uh, This develops over the first few years of life, and there's many studies showing this. I like to show this particular example because this is a study on one infant followed up over the first two years of life. So basically every time the infant pooped, they measured his, his or her microbiome. And what you can see, if you look at diversity, you can see there is this increase in diversity over the first couple of years of life. Um, But it's not a linear, you can see, and this is the value of a longitudinal N of 1 study, you can see there's some points that the diversity suddenly plummets, and then it comes back again. And you can see what happened to that child, and these plummeting effects were typically associated with an antibiotic or a change in diet. So 
these are the kind of studies that really allow us to tease out some of the individual factors that influence the microbiome, and I'll come back to that. And in recent years, I think, you know, in, allergy, in food allergy, in asthma, in atopic dermatitis, people are describing again and again differences in the composition of the gut, the skin, and the lung microbiome. As I said, this, we cannot take this to mean causality, of course, but these associations are repeatedly being described. Uh, so the description of a change is consistent, but the types of bacteria that change are often different. So this is quite confusing for some people who are not fully... Uh, immersed in this area, but I think perhaps with more of the functional profiling, we, we may figure this out uh, to explain it a little bit better in future. But I will give just a couple of examples, um, and this isn't a, a full review of the literature by any means. So this was one study published a couple of years ago. Um, they looked at uh, neonatal um, microbiome profiling, and they were able to group and the neonatal microbiome into three groupings, which they've called here NGM1, 2, or 3, so neonatal gut microbiota 1, 2, or 3. And then they followed these kids up later in life, and they looked at their sensitization patterns. And what they found was those kids who, in the neonatal period, had this type of microbiome were much more likely to be sensitized. And what was a characteristic feature of this microbiome was there was less bifidobacterium, less acromantia, and less fecali bacterium. And in my opinion, this is one of the groupings that, not in all studies, but in many studies, seems to be implicated, this grouping of, of three bacteria, or three types of bacteria. This is a study from the Nagler group that came out earlier this year. Uh, what, so in germ-free mice, you can induce a, uh, a, an anaphylactic response to foods quite easily. Um, and that's what they're measuring here. So this is anaphylaxis in germ-free mice. Um, so they lose temperature. They colonize the mice with a microbiome from a cow's milk allergic kids, and these mice still get anaphylaxis. But when they colonize the mice with a microbiota from a healthy child, these mice no longer get anaphylaxis. So this is really a good indication that there's something in the healthy microbiome, or sorry, the microbiome of a healthy child that's lacking, perhaps, in the microbiome of a child with cow's milk allergy. And they went on and looked at, uh, I won't go into the, the details here, but I guess the summary of the transcription profiling was there was a lot of metabolic changes, actually. It wasn't just immune changes that were associated with the transfer of the microbiome from a healthy infant. And you would say, so what was missing in the microbiome from the cow's milk allergic infant? And this was one of the bacteria, this anaerosteeps, this is one of the firmicutes. And when they sing, or when they monoconalize the germ-free mice with this bacterium, they were able to at least partially reverse some of the anaphylactic response. So this isn't saying that it's all about just this single microbe. It's just giving an example for uh, this microbe and maybe a few others uh, do seem to induce a, a, or have a, an effect in reducing the severity of anaphylaxis, at least in these models. And the last study I just want to highlight, this was from Supinda's work. She looked at kids who were cow's milk allergic. She profiled their microbiome. And then she followed them up a few years later and separated out those kids who had spontaneously resolved their reaction to cow's milk versus those who did not. And she found there was a very significant difference in those microbiomes of those kids who spontaneously resolved or who went on to become tolerant. So again, this is an indication of there's something in this microbiome that's associated with the induction of natural tolerance responses. So we're saying that the microbiome early in life uh, is different. Uh, and uh, what is maybe contributing to what's making it different. So uh, I think this is an area that many people have worked on in, in the last few years. And really many of the early life exposures have a very significant effect on the microbiome. Everything from the diet to the delivery method um, to use of things like antibiotics and so on. And I think we have moved on now from the hygiene hypothesis. So the hygiene hypothesis really, we feel it's more of a misleading misnomer. Actually, you know, it's not about hygiene, it's about exposure to microbes, and it's about acquisition and development of microbes in the first couple of years of life. So in order to maybe move us forward a little bit, we started thinking about this in a different way. And we talked to one of my colleagues who's a, uh, an ecologist, 
about how new species become established in isolated islands. When I say new species, I mean plants and animals. So there are a couple of rules. So first thing, new species have to come from somewhere else. So there's, there's a dispersal rule. And the basic rule of dispersal is the closer the colonist source is, the more new species can come. So if there's an island that's close by, you can imagine lots more plants and animals coming than an island that's far away. And then the other two things that are important are survival factors and extinction events. So you have dispersal, survival, and extinction. That's basic uh, ecology theory. So we wondered, could we apply that to the early life acquisition of microbes? And actually, many of the factors that uh, we've talked about fit to those three rules. So dispersal. So where do you get microbes from early in life? It comes from mum. It comes from other brothers and sisters. It comes from uh, the wider family unit. It comes from uh, animal exposures and so on and so forth. What about survival factors? Well, diet is a really good example of survival. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we're focusing today on, on HMOs, um, and HMOs are clearly a very important factor in uh, the survival of certain microbes. And extinction events. So, antibiotics are a very good example of extinction events. So, many of the things that we know are important for the early life assembly of the microbiome, we can fit to those three different things. But that means that when we think about um, uh, early life microbiome acquisition and assembly, we have to be a little bit more holistic in our thinking. It's, um, you know, many of the lifestyle factors and many of the social factors that uh, uh, is common today actually provide very significant hurdles to, um, to acquisition of microbes and their survival. So one specific um, study I'd like to uh, tell you about, this, uh, this particular uh, graph you've seen many times at these meetings from Caroline, uh, where she showed that early life consumption of yogurt or fruits and veg was associated with a reduced risk of allergies uh, and asthma actually later in life. And so we thought maybe it was because these kids were getting bacteria from the yogurt and they were getting fibres from the fruits and veg. And when you put the bacteria and the fibres together, you get short-chain fatty acids. And there are many studies now showing that these short-chain fatty acids, which are made by bacterial metabolism of these fibres in the gut, so these are non-digestible fibres, you can't digest them, but the bacteria in your gut can, and they release these short-chain fatty acids. And the ones we typically look at are butyrate, propionate and acetate. And these have a number of effects that, uh, on the immune system to, through two really different mechanisms. They can activate G-protein coupled receptors such as GPR41 or 43 or 109A, or they can have an effect by, uh, there are HDAC inhibitors, so they have epigenetic effects also on immune cells. And as many uh, interactions have been described. So what we looked at was uh, Caroline's uh, original study. We were able to get fecal samples from the one-year-old time point, and we measured their short-chain fatty acid levels. And we did this in just over 300 kids. And basically, the way we're showing the data is we've divided the kids up into those with the highest levels or the low versus the lowest levels. And those kids with the lowest levels of butyrate, 56% of them were sensitized by school age. So at six years of age is when this measurement was done. Whereas it was half, or half the, the rate in those kids uh, who had the highest levels of butyrate. And a similar effect was seen with propionate, but not with acetate. And when Caroline looked at the associations back to their dietary data, actually very nicely we saw an association with yogurt and fruit and veg consumption with uh, high levels of butyrate. So our original hypothesis about you may need the bacteria and the fibres in order to get these effects, at least that's supported by this data. So what about a bit earlier in life? So what would be a, the prebiotic earlier in life? And so uh, the excess lactose that the baby doesn't digest for itself can make it into the colon and can be utilised by bacteria in the colon. And I'll just, give you, I'll just show you this one example. So <clears throat> in healthy children, uh, this was the uh, butyrate level in this study. In kids with cow's milk allergy, you can see it was much less. And then in kids who are uh, cow's milk allergic but had uh, lactose added to the formula, you can see it's coming back towards the healthy level. So it seems uh, lactose as a prebiotic can drive or increase uh, short-chain fatty acid levels. And this was also associated with an increase in bifidobacteria in the uh, gut of these children. 
And as you've already heard, uh, HMOs are also a food for bacteria, uh, and um, this has already uh, very nicely been shown by Clement. I usually have a couple of slides around this. I, I was able to take them out. But I just wanted to highlight that uh, there are studies coming out on uh, food allergy showing that the uh, HMO composition of mum's breast milk seems to be associated our differences in the HMO composition of mum's breast milk seems to be associated with a changed risk of the infant developing cow's milk allergy or uh, food sensitization. We don't know, I think, or appreciate which ones are the most important ones in here yet. And before 10 minutes ago or 15 minutes ago, I would have said this effect is, not, uh, is due to a change in the microbiome, but now I appreciate there's many other effects of HMOs too. So I will now say we don't know what the mechanism is. Uh, but clearly, there's a difference. So just in summary, I think uh, microbes are incredibly important uh, for the development of uh, early life immune maturation and uh, appropriate tolerance mechanisms. Uh, we're still only scratching the surface as to exactly which microbes, which metabolites. But I think one important thing is the influence of diet on the ability of the microbiome to uh, to drive some of these tolerance responses uh, seems to be very important. So thank you for your attention.